God. Now there are some people in your life that you will meet that you really don't want to stay connected with. A funeral service is held for a woman who just passed away. As the pallbearers are carrying the casket out, they accidentally bumped into the wall. They hear a faint moan. They open up the casket and find out the woman is actually alive. She lives ten more years and then dies. Then, have a, then she has another funeral for her at the exact same funeral parlor. As the pallbearers begin carrying her out, as they walk towards that same area, so in that same wall, the husband cries out, Watch out for the wall! <laughs> Some people you don't want to stay connected with. Uh, but God knows us completely. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. And right there I just described our deacon board. But he knows the good, the bad, and the ugly about us, but yet he still loves us. If you're taking notes in the back of your newsletter, today, our one simple truth is this. God knows us thoroughly. He knows us thoroughly. But how do we see him? How do we see God? Do we see him like this? One Sunday morning, a little girl and her Sunday best was running so she wouldn't be late for church. And as she ran, she kept praying, Dear God, please don't let me be late to church. Please don't let me be late to church. And as she was running, she tripped and fell. When she got back up, she began praying again as she began running. Please, God, don't, please don't let me be late to church. But don't shove me either. <laughs> is he really a God that demands us to be on time? Yes, he is, by the way. But is he really that type of God who, who almost bullies us? Who cares about sort of external things, about our time and, and about our dress code and about our hair? Like, is he really a God who just sort of pushes us along and forces us to do things? Isn't that how many people see God, though? Uh, if you're saved here, if you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, he is your Father. How does Jesus say that we should pray? Our, our God, which art in heaven? Our master, which art in heaven? Our dictator, which art in heaven? No, he starts off by saying, pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven. But see, religion has taken it and it's skewed that relationship aspect that God wants to have with us. It's, it's turned him into some unknown, divine, long, white beard sitting on a throne far away who is interested in things like where we burn candles. And how we make certain gestures, and what type of robes we wear, and what time we come. And God cares nothing about any of that. He is your heavenly Father who loves and cares about you. He is not a dictator demanding that you bow and kneel a certain way. Amen? Amen. There's an old parable of five blind men. And each blind man was sort of holding on to part of an elephant. And these five blind men, one had the tail, one had the trunk, one had the legs, the tusks, one had the ears... And with that, each of those five men were trying to describe to the other what the animal they were holding on to was actually like. And neither one could give a complete picture of what that elephant was like because they only could feel a certain part of that elephant. May I suggest to you that that is how many people see God? They've only seen a small part. They've only seen a little bit of his judgment. They've only seen a little bit of his standards of what he expects and how we're supposed to love each other and take care of one another. They've only seen a small part, and they have never gotten the full picture of who God really is. If you're taking notes, just let me remind you of this. God gives us three sources to describe himself. Number one, creation. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 tells us, doesn't creation point to the fact that there's a God? Did this all just happen to get here? Did your respiratory system, did a flower just happen to get here? Doesn't all of this point to the fact that there was a divine creator? Also, boy, this is going to kill me. The Bible. God's Word is how He reveals Himself. And lastly, He reveals Himself in Jesus. David wrote about God's nature. And he recorded it here in Psalms 139. And we're going to see six things about God. I'm going to go quickly through these. So don't, when you hear six from me, you think, that's going to be forever. No, we'll go quickly through some of these. But he's going to give us six things about what God knows. Look at verse 1 of Psalms 139. First, O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. The first thing God knows, God knows everything about me. God knows my beginning. He knows what's happened to me. He knows what I've done. He knows every 
single thing about me. If you're taking notes, the word Al, jump over there and help me out on this, please. The word omniscience, omni means all, and science means knowledge. And we're going to each week break one of these words down and show how it applies to God. God is all knowing. Let me just remind you something Satan is not all knowing, demons are not all knowing, angels are not all knowing, even your mother is not all knowing. But God is all that He knows your thoughts. He knows what's going on inside your heart. He knows what you've done. And he knows what you're going to do. Matthew 10.30 says this. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Someone said this. On average, people have 100,000 to 150,000 hairs. Now, some of you, that's a little less. And some of you, that's a little more. Amen. And 100 to 150 hairs fall out each day. Some of you just got all that taken care of early in life, right? That's right. Don't worry about the rest of the year. This number increases each fall and decreases each spring. Plus, there are 6.5 billion people on the planet. Yet, God knows the number of hairs on each of our heads. God is so interested in me. He knows and numbers each one of my hairs, and he even knows the original color. He's so interested in me, he wants to know everything about me. Philip Yancey said this. Uh, he had a friend who said, you sure don't act as if God is alive. If God knows me, that can be scary. I mean, if you're doing something wrong, that's a scary thought to think. God knows what you're thinking and how you're viewing the world and what you're really planning on doing once you get out of your parents' home. If that's true, God, that can be scary. But can I also say this to you? That can also be comforting. Because God knows the pain. You know that comment someone said in junior high that has haunted you and stayed with you and hurt your feelings so bad? And you're still wearing dresses or combing your hair a certain way because of that simple comment in seventh grade? God was there and God knows it. God knows what your father said to you. God knows how your mother treated you. God knows all of these things. That can be very intimidating on one level if you're thinking God's going to judge me. But on the fact that God also knows my hurts is very comforting. The second thing to know about God, look at verse 2. Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising, thou understanding my thoughts afar off. Number two, God knows all of your thoughts. Thoughts. Look at Proverbs 4. It says this. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Young people, especially you, everything starts in your heart. No one just goes, I'm going to do drugs today. No man has ever just gone, I'm going to cheat on my wife today. No one's ever said, well, I'm going to steal today. No one's ever said, well, I'm going to do this today. It doesn't happen that way. What happens is, the issue gets into your heart. Pastor Dave, that song we sang is perfect about God wanting your heart and guard your heart, young people, because it gets in your heart. And what happens, it comes into your heart and then it starts to mellow and starts to process in your brain. And after it comes out of your brain, it goes into your hands and you start to act on it. And then after you act, it will either make your life or destroy your life. Every time you see somebody, there's a few examples, but it is so rare that someone just spontaneously goes, hey, I'm going to try this. I'm going to ruin my life with today. That's not how it happens. It starts in your heart. It goes and grows in your brain. And then it comes out your hands, and it will either make your life or destroy your life. Amen? It's a, listen, and the world is trying to get that heart. I mean, from the entertainment it wants you to have certain values, Hollywood and music and everything, but it wants to like throw issues like lust when you're a young man or a young lady and put it in your heart. It wants to put materialism in your heart so that it can start to grow and to go into your mind and it will alter and destroy your life. It has all sorts of things. It wants to drive you away with pride. It wants to drive you further and further away from God with covetousness. The world wants to do all of these things. It's aimed at your heart, young people, because if they can get your heart, Eventually, it'll get your mind, and it'll come out your hands, and it'll destroy your life. That's right. The third thing about God, look at verse 3. Thou compassest my path, and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Number three, God tracks 
our every move. God tracks our every move. What is GPS? Uh, listen, a few years ago, there was very few people who knew what that is. But even people in nursing home today know what GPS is. Global Positioning Satellites. And, uh, it lets you know anywhere in the world where you're at. I love my iPhone. That's one of the best things. You can just go boom and hit that on the map. And it will show you your current position. And it will find you unless you're in Streeter because nothing works in Streeter. But, and it will go boom and it will triangulate. And it will find you completely where you're at. Whether you're in a car. Whether you're a soldier or the Army and the Marines. They track the soldiers. They have GPS on some of their helmets. And they can tell where each soldier is and where they're going. It tracks you and lets you know. And by the way, parents, do you know you can do that on teenagers too? On some of their cell phones, you can track it. Hopefully I'm not giving anything away, but I'm letting you know. Um, but if you're taking notes, in a sea of humanity, God still knows where we are. In a sea of humanity, God still knows where we are. Again, that could be bad. I mean, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. God knows where you're at. But then I also say this to you, that in a moment of chaos, in the moments when your entire family is being destroyed and your entire world is falling down around you and you feel like no one loves you and you feel completely isolated from any type of connection with any human being, God still knows you. And he keeps track of every move and every heartache. Proverbs 18 says this, And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That is my Jesus. That's my Lord. That's my Savior. Amen. If you haven't had a brother, you need to get one. You really need to bypass 0 to 18 and then get a brother. But uh, I had a brother. I have a brother. I've got two. One is 13 months older than me. And, uh, we shared a room. We shared a bath. We shared everything when we were little. I mean, all the way up, we shared a room until we were 16. And Sandra one time asked me, why don't you and Bill at family gatherings talk or do much with each other? And I said, when, we, when we, he turned 16 and I was 15, my one brother moved out and Bill went down to the basement and got the bedroom down there and I got my own room and we basically had an agreement. We've seen enough of each other. <laughs> we've seen enough. And we've got enough. I'm say something. You can say what you want about your brother, but no one else can say anything about him. That's right. Because your brother will be there to back you up and to take care of you and to love you. That's the way Jesus describes himself. Not as a, a piece of, of a concrete that's carved a certain way. Not even as a piece of wood or a statue. Not even as a building. Not even as a robe or a camp. He doesn't describe himself in any other way. He describes himself as our brother who sticks closer than anyone else. The fourth thing about God, look at verse 4. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all. Number four, God knows every word we say. Can I even add that God knows every word we say even before we know what you're going to say? It? Um, God knows what I'm going to say, and, and I, I sometimes listen back to the tape when I'm editing it. And I've always mispronounced the king's language great. I sometimes look at some of the things I said, I really said that, and I backed it up and thought, I'd like to make a blooper tape once. Uh, but some of you, that's the only thing you would ever remember. But uh, God knows everything we're going to say before we say it. You know my wife? Hello, wife. My wife knows all of my jokes, don't you? I mean, there's a few I get that she doesn't know. She knows all of my illustrations, don't you? You've heard me preach, I mean, since... What, maybe a thousand? Maybe more? I don't know how many times, but almost every time I've preached, other than a handful of times, you've been in the crowd, whether I was a student with the groups, and whether it be small, whether it be church, whether it be all sorts of things, you've heard it, and you have heard just about everything I have to say out of you. Every now and then I surprise you, though, don't I? Every now and then. But she knows all of you. know why she knows this? And she can finish some of my messages for you. And she knows my jokes, and she knows what I'm going to say, because there's an intimacy there. She has spent time with me. She has spent time listening to me until she got an iPhone. <laughs> You're sending me a text, Dan. There is a connection that has taken place there. Can I tell you this? That God knows everything because in our relationship, He has a desire to be intimate with us. 
He has a desire to constantly. And it's completely, in many cases, a one-way street. That God wants to know so much about us, every hair, every word, everything, because God wants an intimate relationship that takes place with us. Remember, your words can hurt or they can build you up. And if you're taking notes, words matter because God is listening. Parents, words matter because God is listening. Benjamin West was a British artist, and he tells how he became aware of his artistic skill. One day, his mother went on out, leaving him in charge of his little sister, Sally. In his mother's absence, he discovered some bottles of colored ink. And to amuse her, he began to paint Sally's portrait. In doing so, he made quite a mess of things, spilling numerous ink splotches here and there. When his mother returned, she saw the mess, but said nothing about it. She deliberately looked beyond all that she, that she picked up the pieces of paper. Smiling, she explained, why, it's Sally. She then stooped and kissed her son. From that time on, Benjamin West would say, my mother's kiss made me a painter. Parents, words matter because God is listening. The fifth thing, look at verse 5. Thou hast beset or preceded me, be up, be up behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. The fifth thing to know about God is God knows how to protect us. God knows everything I do and everything I say and where I go. When I was young at the time, that sort of seems like a killjoy. God knows everything, where I'm going, what I'm doing. That doesn't seem like fun to me. And many churches have beaten people down into submission with this thought. But ultimately it means God is there, He knows everything I'm going through and what I'm facing. It ultimately means that God is protecting us. He protects us from three things. Number one, He protects us from the world. Young people, the world is a rotten, horrible place. You've gotten this idea from movies and TV shows that places like bars are fun and exciting places. They are loud, they are obnoxious, and young ladies, they, you will get abused in them. They are either that or they are dark, dank places with depressed despair everywhere. The world will try to tell you that, hey, everything it has to offer is glittery and shiny, but I want to tell you this, that everything the world has to offer is disease, destruction, and death. Secondly, he saves us from Satan. Now, I don't really believe in, in Satan. Where were you on 9-11? And ultimately, though, he protects us from ourselves. The sixth thing, the last thing to know about God, look at verse 6. Such is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. The sixth thing to know about God, God's knowledge is beyond our comprehension. So Pastor Steve, I, I just want to explain God. I want God to, I want to be able to put God into a box. Do you really want a God that you can explain? Do you really want a God that you can mathematically show everything he's done and how he's acting? The moment I can explain God is the moment I get a new God. Because I know my level of mentality. And by the way, isn't that what most people have done? I can't explain everything about God, so therefore there must not be a God. I can't explain how a car completely works. I can't explain how my cell phone completely works, but I know it does. Amen? Psalms 35, 17 says this, Lord, thou wilt look on, rescue my soul from their destruction. There's nothing wrong with wondering why God allows certain things to happen. Can, amen? God, why is there famine? Why is there pediatric AIDS? Why are there orphans, God? Why are there wars? Why are all of these things taking? Why are there starving kids? Why is it the south side of Chicago that kids being shot just simply because they're, they're doing a lemonade stand outside their home? Why are there so many things happening, God? It is not wrong to ask God these questions why he's a big boy, he can take it. It is not wrong to do that. But may I suggest to you, when you are examining God for all the wrong things in the world, would you please also examine yourself? When we like to blame God for everything that is wrong, maybe it's time that we also realize that God has put us on this planet for a purpose. Two people were having a conversation. One said, I like to ask God why he allows poverty, famine, and pain when he could do something about it. The other person responded with this, I am afraid that God might ask me the same question. 
Why do we allow things when there's things that we can do about it? The majority of what we blame God for is really the inactivity of people who claim to know Him. <coughs> Amen? Listen, I don't want to get political. I want you to understand something. Taking care of the poor is not the responsibility of the United States federal government. It is the responsibility of Grace Baptist Church to help. It is the responsibility of believers. It is the responsibility of churches. And we have abdicated that responsibility for tax exemption. We are the ones that are supposed to be the light and the salt of the world. We are the ones that are supposed to be making a difference. Not any government. By the way, I've never yet seen a government that could do what an individual group of believers could do. I have spent times in charities. I have spent times in rescue missions. I have spent times in soup kitchens. I have spent times feeding poor people. I have spent times at uh, uh, homes for mentally challenged. And I look around and I've never yet seen a government inspector or a government agent there. But I have seen people who believe in Jesus Christ, who He has changed their life, and they have been pushed to serve and take care of people that naturally they never would do. So when we ask God why, may I suggest to you that maybe God is looking back to us today and also saying why? I'm going to tell you something about Pastor Steve. I am afraid of ladders. <laughs> now I thought about that uh, this morning and realized that's really not true. Uh, my wife is afraid of windmills. She thinks they're going to come alive and eat us all one day. <laughs> but anyways, so uh, that's really not true. I'm not afraid of ladders. I don't think they're going to come to life. I don't think it's going to go, ah, attack me or anything like that. I'm not afraid of ladders. Um, I am afraid of falling. Because one time I was up on a big ladder when I was young and I fell. And I didn't like it. Thank God, I landed in a bush. And it really wasn't that high, only a couple feet. But, but I have gone up on ladders many times because I've had to. When we do the screen, you see that wire and we put the big screen up there? I go up on that ladder, it's like 20, 15 feet or whatever. And I'll climb up there and do it lots of times. And I hold on to that ladder for dear life and I hate it. Uh, at our last church, we had a 40 foot high wall. And we had to paint it. I went up on a big scaffolding 40 feet up and I'm helping prime and I'm holding onto the scaffolding and, and I'm holding onto this ladder and I'm leaning over. I was petrified the entire time, but I did it. Why? Because I had to do it. So I can do it if I have to, but if given a chance, I would rather keep my feet on the ground. This is how I want to illustrate God in our life. God will ask you to do many things in your life that you are uncomfortable with. Um, some of you, you have issues with your parents and your grandparents and how you were raised. And you might have complete, legit issues. I mean, it's, it's your, if you told your story, we'd all agree, man, that was bad. But yet you've never forgiven your dad. I didn't say restore the relationship. I mean, just, just forgive and walk away and say, okay, I forgive you and I won't carry the bitterness. And we, God says, listen, I want you to, to do this. And I, I can't go up that run with God. I can't do that. There's some of you. <laughs> Morgan, you graduated. We talked to this a little bit. God's going to ask you to do something with your life. Young people, what are you going to do with your life? You have 20,000 days. 20,000 days to live on this planet. You're going to follow God and go down a difficult path? What if God wants you to be a missionary? What if God wants you to be a preacher? Friend? <laughs> what if God just wants you to be a, a teacher in a certain place? What if God wants you to pick up everything you have and move to a completely different area? And at that time like this, you're like, well, God, let it be Hawaii. <laughs> what if God wants you in Alaska? I couldn't do that. What if God wants you to finally deal with your addiction? I mean, come on. Your wife doesn't know about it, but God knows. He sees it. I mean, your pastor doesn't know where you're at Saturday night, doesn't know how you're handling it, doesn't know what you're doing. But let's face it, you got an addiction. And God finally wants you to come face to face with the reality that it is destroying your life, and He wants you to do something about it. What if it's just faith? God, here's my money. I fall. Bury me facing east. <laughs> what if it's God? Here's my money. That's about as far as I can. 
<laughs> what if here's everything I've got? Here's my checkbook. Here's, here's my, I'm not going to fight you anymore. I'm not going to do this. This is it. We can keep going up the ladder. God is going to ask you to go and go in some very difficult places. You know what? This is faith. But ultimately, I can go up this ladder and be part of this and have complete security when I realize that the God of the universe knows me. He knows that I'm afraid. He knows what my issues are. And when I have complete assurity of the God of the universe knows and loves me and cares about me, He knows that I fell before. He knows that I've got problems. And when I have complete faith in Him and know Him, I can go up because why? It's not the ladder that scares me. It's the falling that scares me. It's not the journey of your life that scares you. It's making the wrong choice. It's not the addiction and getting it out of your life that scares you. It's all the pain. It's not forgiving your father that scares you. It's all the memories and all the tears that it's going to bring up. When I know that the God of the universe is looking out for me, I can go anywhere he asks me to. Because if I fall, he's there. If he cares about the hairs on my head, then he's going to care if I fall and hurt myself. So what kind of God do you have? A God that wants you to stay on the floor? Or a God that's trying to push you into uncomfortable situations and difficult issues? Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you hear me scream, I go.